Hey guys, Brian here, bringing you a game of Headquarters on Jungle. I think this is the first game of Headquarters I'm ever bringing you guys in all the videos I've ever done. TS Gameplay actually had talked about Headquarters a week or so ago and was really encouraging me to play it because it was one of those game types I never really got involved in. So he did talk me into it and we played a couple games. And I was actually a little bit disappointed while I was going through the footage that I had edited down to the couple good games that I had. Because the last game that we had on, uh, I want to say it was, uh, it wasn't WMD, uh, it was Grid, it was Grid. I went like 31-3, and three. and the gameplay, when I went back to review it, I don't know what was going on with my HD PVR, but it, it was pretty choppy, and this one has a couple choppy moments as well, so I won't apologize for that up front, but I really wanted to use one of these headquarters videos, and this one wasn't anywhere near as bad as the other one. I still put up a pretty good score, and uh, we definitely dominated this other team totally. So I decided I would just use this one. And we've been trying to play more headquarters since the new map pack came out. But with the new maps, it seems like everyone is camping much more than they do on the original core maps. I, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to me. Because I know, you know, obviously when any kind of new map pack comes out, we all want to learn the ins and outs, learn the magical hot routes and the high traffic areas and... Some people want to learn camping spots, but how are you going to learn all the maps when pretty much all you do is, is the second you find one corner, you sit in it, or you find one window and you never leave. I really don't know how that's going to help your learning curve in general, but that really just seems to be the case right now. I'm sure many of you have experienced the same thing that we have. I'm hoping things settle down soon. I'm guessing it's going to take a couple weeks till everyone actually does decide to finally come out of their comfort zone or their hiding really spot and move around the maps around. a little more and learn some of the high traffic areas and everything else a little bit better. And they become more like the original maps are. But one thing I'm going to tell you real quick is I'm going to talk about a couple other things during this video. My general strategy for headquarters is normally to of course defend and try to capture the objective, but at the same time I try to play a little bit more of an aggressive style. Uh, not evidence at this very second, but you will see it points in this gameplay. I try to constantly keep flanking the enemy and stay a little bit further away from the objective and move to capture it when needed. How well that strategy really works depends upon the other players within your team. Uh, in this game, uh, we did have, in, in addition to TS, we had plenty of other guys that were very objective-oriented and always went to capture it and defend it and stayed very, very close to the target, so I was able to do my thing a little bit more. I tried to cut the enemy team off from getting to the target from further away and also cutting them off once we do capture it throughout this game. Because much like Domination and Demolition and the other objective type games, I mean, if you hover too close to the objective, obviously every single player is going to throw every grenade they have into that target area. And even with Flak Jacket, with the amount of grenades that are going to be coming in there, you're not going to survive. And it's going to be a lot harder to defend that target. So you really try to want to set up a little bit bigger of a perimeter, cover all the access areas from a little bit more of a distance. And right here, this is a good example of it. I came around the back where these guys were not expecting me to go. And one of the guys on this team, I don't know what he was doing. He's still laying right next to the objective. I just killed three of his teammates, took the time to plant a claymore. And this guy did not even turn around to, you know, engage me whatsoever. I mean, really, I'm not running ghosts. I'm not running with a silenced weapon. The guy, I could see his teammates dying all around him, and he really did nothing. Since I did have such a good game the last time, which I already mentioned, I did feel pretty bold here, and I went with an 8, 9, 11 kill streak. I, well, I'm, I'm going to tell you, I did never achieve my dog's kill streak, but obviously I just got my Blackbird, and I can see these guys, thankfully, with the Blackbird coming, that they're coming up, and I finally got my Chopper Gunner, and that freaking grenade has to keep me from getting my dogs. Oh well, what can you do? The worst part of dying from that grenade was I sold my Blackbird up and now that we have the headquarters captured, I gotta wait to respawn so I can't really take part in any of the killing and the carnage that I could bestow upon the other team by knowing exactly where they were. Pretty disappointing, but at least now I get to call my Chopper Gunner. And unlike most commentators, I'm not gonna fast forward this because I don't get the Chopper Gunner very often, so you guys are gonna have to watch it with me. TS and I were talking about it when I called it in. I probably didn't pick the best time to call this. I should have waited until after we captured the headquarters and then called it in from a nice safe spot a good distance away just to keep them from destroying it. But I guess I was a little too excited. Like I said, I don't run the chopper gunner very often. 
So I just went ahead and called it in. And obviously he cleared, and, uh, <laughs> cleared the mat enough so that we could easily capture the headquarters going forward. But I've really talked about the gameplay a lot more than I had originally planned on. So since we're roughly halfway through this video, I guess I probably should move on to the second thing I wanted to talk to you guys about. Today is February 5th, which means for those of you who know, and just in case you need a reminder, Valentine's Day is February 14th. And since I am older and I have a little bit more experience in this area, and I know many of you are less than half my age, to say the least. God, I really hate saying that, but anyhow. I'm sure many of you have girlfriends of different seriousness, whether it's uh, just something casual where you guys hang out on the weekend for you really younger guys. If you're in your late teens, if it's something a little more steady, or or even if any of you older guys can take anything from what I'm going to say next, you know, I'm glad to have helped. And if any of you want to ask me any questions after this, please feel free. Like I said, uh, I am a lot older, so I have been through many, many Valentine's Day throughout my life. Uh, I have been married now for three and a half years, and obviously I have had many short-term and long-term relationships of all various lengths with uh, many different women throughout my life. And I know Valentine's Day can be a little bit tricky, and most of the women I've dated throughout my uh, history have always told me that I've been very, very creative and I come up with some unique things, uh, different than the norm as far as gift giving or whatever you plan to do for that evening. I know that's one thing that my wife always complains about now, whenever a holiday such as this or Christmas or birthdays arise, that she says, I, I always do such a good job of coming up with something different and surprising her and she's never really able to surprise me at all. I mean, she has once or twice in the nine or so years that we've been together as a whole but, like I said, you know, many women have told me that I'm pretty good at this kind of thing. So I want to help any of you guys out that may be struggling for ideas. Or just want to stand out a little bit different. Or, like I said, just do something a little more special or surprising. This is going to sound kind of stupid, but one of the things my wife and I do every Valentine's Day. And this tradition kind of started by accident. But now we just kind of run with it every year. The first year we were together, obviously we were going to go out and do a traditional type dinner at a, you know... Not necessarily like a suit and tie type restaurant, because that's really not our style. But just, you know, a regular restaurant in general. Uh, something a little higher standard than like TGI Fridays or or uh, Applebee's. But obviously not quite, you know, a five star. You know, I have to wear a tux and I can't take my jacket off the whole time dinner. But every place that we went on, on uh, the Valentine's Day night we had like an hour, hour and a half wait. Because the middle level restaurants really don't take reservations, so it's pretty much a crapshoot. And every place we drove, we drove around for probably well over an hour trying to find a place, and we obviously didn't want to wait that long. Hindsight, if we had just stopped at the first one, considering how long we did drive, we probably could have been sitting down to have dinner. But as we kept driving up and down the highway, checking every different restaurant along the way, we kept driving past Hooters. And we had gone there a couple times before to watch a hockey game or a football game or something like that. And it got to the point that my wife actually just said, you know, of getting so tired and so hungry she's like why don't we just go into Hooters and have dinner so we did and the wait obviously wasn't very crowded and the waitresses you know hung out and talked to us and you know we told them the story and you know they all got a kick out of it and as we told some of our other friends and family members they just thought it was hilarious that we actually ended up going to Hooters on Valentine's Day and the following year we kind of made a half-hearted effort to go out to dinner again but we ended up at Hooters and now every year, we don't even question it. We just go to Hooters for dinner every Valentine's Day. And it's like our little unique quirky type thing. Which I think most couples, when you're together a longer amount of time, you guys have something like that. And another year, I surprised her with... I don't remember exactly which concert it was. I did one for her birthday one year and one for Valentine's Day. I'm pretty sure this was a Billy Joel concert uh, that I got tickets for us to go to on Valentine's Day. Uh, I didn't tell her where we, go where we were going after dinner. I just started driving across the bridge, and we and then she obviously realized we were going to some form of event, but I wouldn't tell her what it was until she saw the sign. So that was a nice surprise for her as well. Now, obviously, a lot of the things that I can do, being older and having a job, may be a little bit outside of some of you younger guys' budgets. But if you are having any trouble or have any questions or want some ideas that may be within your price range, just drop a comment. I'll be more than happy to help you guys out because for me to really list everything or talk about everything within this commentary would be a little bit unreasonable and unmanageable. So shoot me a message, leave a comment if you do want any tips or ideas from me. 
And like I said, tell me what your budget is, you know, how long you guys have been together, how serious you are, and I'll try to help you guys the best I can and give you something a little more original that you can get your woman other than the traditional flowers and box of heart-shaped candy. Because while that stuff is nice, uh, everyone does that. It's too, it's too ordinary. And like I said, if you want to do something a little bit different, I'm going to try to help you the best I can. And actually, since I mentioned flowers, I will tell you one other funny story. For anyone who has bought flowers on uh, Valentine's Day before, we all know that you can normally buy a dozen roses for anywhere from like 30 to $40 any other time of the year. But on Valentine's Day, they know that is such a staple of the holiday that they pretty much triple or quadruple the price and you're going to spend well over $100 for a dozen roses which are not in anywhere near good a shape as what you can buy any other time of year because they're buying them in such bulk and preparing the bouquets so far in advance for the insatiable demand of men out there that buy this stuff for their you know, wives and girlfriends. So I actually did start the tradition as well as buying a dozen roses for my wife a couple days before Valentine's Day. So that way she still has them. They are still in beautiful condition for the holiday. Now, I don't recommend this for you guys that are not in long-term relationships and you don't do these little quirky things on a regular basis because they might not appreciate the way my wife does. I said, thankfully, she's, she's a really cool woman and she, you know, she gets me for who I am and really appreciates some of the funny things like that that I do on occasion. But like I said, I'm looking forward to hearing from you guys and I'm going to help you out the best that I can. Obviously, the game is over. I ended up going 39 and 12. And I left this last part in because I wanted you to see the massive XP that you get for playing Headquarters. I ended up with over 21,000 experience points. And right now with it being double XP weekend, get in there and play some Headquarters. You'll thank me later for all the XP you get.